No, it works. Okay, back again. This concept of buying a lot or buying less each time you buy is of course related to the fact that these resources are scarce. Okay, if it, they were unlimited, then there would be no cost involved here. So in that case, this scarcity concept is, is underlying everything we talk about. There is a third point here. Related, it's written like uh, it's written uh, uh, by prices uh, slash rationing. Um, before we had money, we exchanged stuff. Okay, that is economic activity as well, isn't it? What is the point of having money? Why do we have money? It's a kind of common value structure. That, that's correct, yeah, definitely. Uh, but if you compare using money to, to just exchanging, what do you achieve by using money? Well, if I want to exchange my car to a horse, my feeling could be that my car is much more worth than the horse. Then I can't do that, can I? But if there's a middle point here, where I can sell my car to this middle point, and the horse guy can sell his horse to the middle point, then I can buy the horse. Having money left, the horse guy will have to add some more money to get the car, of course. But then we make the transaction happen. So money kind of oils this system. It kind of makes it possible to buy non-dividable stuff in, in small parts, so to speak. Okay, that, that's the idea. But for money to be sensible, there must be prices. Okay, so there must be a price tag on the product we would like to buy. And these prices, they are of course evident, they must be there. The prices change depending on the demand and supply, among other th stuff, yeah, at least in general. Uh, but th there's also another effect of prices. Because prices, they ration, as we say. They ration the use of the resource. So when the prices are high, fewer people can buy it. When the prices are low, more people can buy it. Okay, so you kind of get a smooth transition here. In Norway, in the health services, we have a system where there is no payment. Okay, it's free of charge. And uh, if resources were not scarce, that would not be a problem, would it? But unfortunately, resources are scarce. There's a lot of people who want to do surgery, for instance, or want to go to the doctor and get uh, brain scans or whatever. Okay? Everybody is, has some kind of disease, don't they? <coughs> Either it's real or it's uh, imagined, okay? And if you kind of open health services to everybody, everybody has something they want to talk to the doctor about. Especially if you move to the other part of health services, the psychiatric part. We all know, don't we, that there is always some problems in our heads, isn't it? Or maybe that's just me. There's al always something we would like to change, isn't it? We would be more happy or we would be, yeah, okay, you know what it's about. So what we do in Norway, eh, to ration, to meet this problem of the scarce resource, what do you think we do? We don't use prices, because if we had used prices, we can do the rationing, couldn't we? We could make this very expensive surgery very expensive. But that would have some kind of effect, wouldn't it? The effect would be that only the rich people could use the resource, okay? So to avoid that, we make the resource free, but we don't have enough of the resource. So who do, how do we decide who will get to use the resource? Then? We use a queue, don't we? Oh, of course, you don't line up outside the hospitals, but there is a queuing system here, isn't it? Yeah, okay, so uh, we have only these 100 bypass operations a year, and then 100 novitians will get the bypass operation a year. Of course, it's a little bit more than that. This was just an example. Then, of course, if you don't get the bypass operation this year, you might die. But the difference here is that the one who dies could either be poor or rich, okay. as opposed to the American system, where the rich guy gets the bypass. So you see the differences here. So that's the point here. These prices, they don't only kind of serve as a signal about value, they also structure the market. They decide who will get the resource and who will not get it. And of course, this is the major problem of capitalism, isn't it? That only those with the money has free access to the resources. And those without, do not have. This is the 
major com concept behind communism, isn't it? You would like everybody, in a fair way, to have access to all the resources. Unfortunately, as economists have known all the day, all the time, resources are scarce. So then you really can't make this equation go up, can you? So, so far we still haven't found a better system, have we? Than the capitalist system. At least we believe that in Europe and in the United States, and in Japan, and in South Korea, perhaps not in North Korea. I don't know. How is it in China these days, Isabella? Do you still have communism? Um, there's a okay, so there is uh, still... Uh, yeah, we don't need to go into this. Okay, we can. These problems... Um, what about Russia, Kelly? You don't have communism anymore. You used to have it yes. before your time, I presume. Before my time, yeah. yeah. When did it did it but go? I experienced it a little bit. Yeah. When did it go away? Ninety one. Uh, yes, nineteen ninety one. Yeah. How old were you then? Eighty five. Eighty five. Eighty When did the Berlin Wall fall? Eighty nine. Yes. Okay. Yeah. I think eighty nine is a crucial point here. Yeah. Eighty nine, ninety nine, two thousand and nine. It's the 25 year anniversary this year, isn't it? Ah. I haven't seen anything about that. They are not celebrating. No, there's been a lot of uh, programs on. Actually, there's, there's been a lot of programs on Norwegian television about Stasi the other days. You know what Stasi is? You haven't heard this term? Police. Yeah, it's the secret police in Eastern Germany, the old DDR, the Deutsche Demokratische Republik. That's right, isn't it, Germans? Have you been there, Elke? in the new new area. It's no difference anymore. Yeah. You know, in the old days, the, the DDR was a great sport nation. They won all the goals every time. Do you know how they did that? <laughs> Let's hear some uh, answers from the Germans here. Do you have an explanation of, for this obvious... Uh, this? Uh, we, know, we know the story, don't we? It was a use of drugs to achieve these great results. <laughs> But I don't think anybody could uh, say that they have the, the a clean path here. Almost everybody has applied this strategy, more or less structured ways. OK, so uh, now I'm moving in all directions here. You must stop me, OK? I'm, uh, I'm missing the point here. It says something about theories and models here. This is kind of a, a point. Uh, OK. We have a theory. One theory could be that we assume that people are greedy, okay? That's a theory. That's, that's kind of some, a building block. Now, based on this theory, we can develop models, can't we? Because uh, if people are greedy, and then we can construct something like the profit, that profit could be a function of something, and it typically is uh, revenue minus some costs, okay? And uh, there could be some functions here. So the, the, the revenue depends on some decisions we make, maybe some decisions the market make, maybe some decisions other agents make, the same on the cost side. And then we can, can for instance, try to maximize the profit over these possible variables of this equation. This is a model. Okay? So we can use our theory to build models. But we need some, some basic assumptions here. And in general, the, the only real basic assumption in economic theory, as I've already said, is that of greed. Okay? As uh, there was a film called Wall Street. Has anybody seen that film? It was uh, who was lead the leading actor. This Michael. No. Was it Martin Sheen? No. Michael Douglas. Yeah, that's right. And he had this famous sentence: "Greed is good." Do you remember that one? That's a great sentence, isn't it? Yeah, most people don't think greed is good, but uh, from an economist's point of view, greed is really good. We need greed. If there's no greed, then there's no, no economics. Greed is driving, okay? If there is a market out there, you see this market, I can earn money here, okay? Then you kind of flow into that market. Then there's more competition, prices go down. This is nice for consumers. This is kind of the basic idea of Adam Smith, the father of economic theory, okay? He said that when markets work, that's good for everyone. Of course, people earn money, but it's better for those who don't earn money today, okay? Because they get employed, they get jobs, they, okay? 
The problem with this is, of course, that the wealth is not evenly distributed. Okay? Those who own the factories get extremely rich. Those who work there get a little bit richer. But the difference to the really rich one increases. That's kind of what it has to be. It has to be like that. But OK, I don't have any other. The final concepts here, positive versus normative, is important in all kinds of science, especially in economic theory. The concept of normative, do you know what that means? Yeah? Can anybody explain the term normative for me? Yeah, you could say so, but uh, the idea here is, in this sense, is that when we do normative research, then we assume that we, we look at problems, finding strategies for agents. What is the best to do? How can I, I meet my challenges in the best possible manner? Then we do normative research. A positive, or often referred to as descriptive research, an alternative to positive is descriptive, means that we kind of look outside and, and try to ask questions, what will happen here? If this agent is normative and that agent is normative, what will be the consequence of that? Kay. How will the market equilibrium, as we tend to use in economic theory, look like? So instead of engaging in solving problems for economic agents, we look at it outside and try to explain what happens. So there is no norm here. We are kind of not interested in what's best for people. We assume that they act in their best interest, but we're really interested in the outcome, the result. Microeconomics is a positive science or a descriptive science. That's the main point here. Business administration, on the other hand, is normative. Okay. The idea is to find out what's best for the company. How should they keep do their bookkeeping? How should they do their logistics and that kind of stuff? Logistics is typically a normative. Both macro and macroeconomics, so in sense all economic theories, uh, apart from the business administrative part, is more interested in, in, uh, in uh, the positive or descriptive parts of it. So we're, we're kind of interested in trying to explain here. Why does stuff look as they look? Why are the prices as they are? Why do the Norwegian government invest in the petroleum industry and that kind of stuff? So this was, these are some important concepts. There are, of course, a lot of other important concepts, but these are kind of mentioned in the textbook here. OK, markets. Markets, for a market to be present, there must be buyers and sellers available. OK? Uh, in our setting, the consumers, they sell work labor services and they buy consumer products. Okay. Producers, they buy raw materials, they buy labor, but they sell the consumer products. So again, you see this duality, you both sell and buy, but we kind of separate here into kind of those who have a kind of primary focus on selling and those who have a primary, primary focus on consuming or buying. Consuming is, in a sense, the same as buying. Okay? There's really no difference in these two words. We, we kind of use these words interchangeably in economic theory. One of the problems with economic theory is that the same thing has a lot of names. In some cases, these lot of names mean exactly the same. In other cases, they don't mean exactly the same. You just have to learn this. Okay? And then, whenever buyers and sellers meet in transactions, a market forms. Or more stringently at the bottom here, a market is the collection of buyers and sellers that through their actual or potential interactions determine the price of a product or a set of products. So this market concept needs some agents to meet there and they need either to do something there now or there must be some expectation that they will do something there in the future. Have you heard about the concept called a future market? A future market is a market where you today negotiate prices for products that should be transacted in the future. So I can make a contract with Kelly that next year, Kelly, you and me should go to Moscow and drink a beer. And if it rains the day we come there, I will pay. If not, you will pay. Okay. That is a future transaction, isn't it? 
the transaction takes place when we go to Moscow. One of us will then have to put them on. There's a lot of these markets existing. Typically in, in uh, raw material markets, there's a lot of future markets around. This opens up the room, okay? Instead of buying everything today, you can make a contract that you agree to buy something in the future, or you can make a contract that you can agree to buy in the future, given some exercise options as well. So all these kind of contracts makes the market mar markets more smooth, so to speak. They kind of opens up for doing more complex kind of transactions. But the concept should be clear, okay? We need buyers, we need sellers, and we need transactions to pay take place. And these transactions involve interchange of money and objects or services. Okay? There must be an interchange here. Those who buy, pay money. Those who sell, they either give physical objects or services of one kind or, or another. It could take place now or in the near future or in the, in the far future for that matter's sake, depending on the contract you write. And as we already have talked about, there are different markets. Okay? There are markets for this and markets for that and markets for everything, isn't it? Some important market-related concepts. A, a little typo here. I, I, the first one, just ignore the first one, okay? Uh, you see there's two market definitions here. The, the last one is perhaps the best, which market geographically and range of products, okay? So we can have geographical market. We can talk about the Norwegian market. We can talk about the regional market here. We can talk about the United States market in general. We can talk about product-related markets. So we can talk about the Norwegian oil market, the Russian oil market, and so on, okay? So all these kind of combinations are possible. We can talk about uh, the market for theatrical tickets, the market for world championship in football tickets, and so on. <coughs> There's a concept called arbitrage here. Have you heard this word before? No. Arbitrage m means certain profit. What is certain profit? That means uh, that I know with 100% certainty that if I make a certain investment, I will earn some revenue on that. Okay, I get some added back. And if that is the case, then I can become infinitely rich, can't I? Because if it's possible to repeat this investment, I can do it in an infinite cycle. And each time I do it, I get a certain profit. If it is like that, then we have, we have no economic system working. See, that, that cannot happen. If that happens, then everything breaks down. Because I have the secret to earn an infinite amount of money, then all these other guys around, you and everybody else, will not earn anything. So I will capture all money in the world, all values, all estate, everything. And of course, if I do that, then uh, I'm hard to negotiate with. So that cannot happen. Okay? So if, if, if there are subgroups, subsystems in economic market activity that kind of shows arbitrage possibilities, then that's a problem. Then you need to regulate. We have seen these situations from time to time. Uh, in the betting market for football, uh, there's a lot of stuff there, you know. There's a lot of corruption and uh, black money and a lot of problems. But uh, one problem there, even in the open market, is that people have shown that if you go into all these betting places and if you combine these odds, it's possible to make a certain profit. So by placing sensible bets on one bookmaker, adding covering on other sets of bookmakers, it's possible to show mathematically that given the data we can see today, you can find sure betting spots. Okay. Of course, that is a possibility of arbitrage, isn't it? As long as these profits, they don't have to be high. If it's high enough to cover the transaction costs or the costs involved with doing this, then it's a problem. Yes, Matt? That's correct, because it's a finite uh, problem. But of course, in principle, you can. In any case, it's a problem. If you try and bet too much, then you won't, you won't get it. Yeah, but you just have to do it repeatedly, uh, every minute or, or whatever. Of, you're right. Of course, there is some regulation, regulating power here that uh, if you. But of course, to, to, to bet much, you need to have much. So uh, th there is other problems here. But uh, this is more like a principal problem, OK? If you have arbitrage possibilities, that is corrupting any economic or financial market. 
Hmm? It's like stock market. Yeah, of course, if, if I know with certainty that a certain stock will go up at one point and go down at another point, of course, then I can. Then I can at least bet all I have. And if I'm a smart guy, I would, uh, would talk to the bank and say, here's an option. Uh, can you talk to all the other banks and all the other guys and we can put all into this, then we get even rich, richer than we are. Then you can kind of construct at least some theoretical infinity situation. We often refer to an arbitrage situation as a money pump, okay, or a, a money tree. You just pick money down from the tree. Okay. A competitive market, we have already said that, that no agent has price impact. Okay, That's the idea of a competitive market, a market where which works as it should, then there is no price impact. So my dis the decision I make in a competitive market will not influence the price. That's the idea. Uh, the market price would still fluctuate over time, okay, so it changes. The fact that the price changes does not necessarily mean that this is not a competitive market or that it is a competitive market. Any market will have price fluctuations, they will change. That the, there's, there's a lot of external factors, isn't it, involved in the price formation. For instance, weather could be relevant if you think about uh, events. If you want to sell a jazz concert at the Rumstals Museum locally under the local jazz festival, of course, if it rains, then less people come and you will have to probably sell the tickets cheaper than in the sunny case. So all th these external effects, which of course involves in the preferences for the consumers, especially in this case, uh, will have impact on the actual price. So you, you should expect that the price should kind of vary. You should not expect a fixed price. That's, uh, that's kind of obvious. So these are uh, some points. We didn't discuss the monopoly here. We could have done that, but we already said that. <coughs> OK, that was chapter one, I think. And according to the plan, we should also have chapter two today. So let's see if you are able to finish that. I'm not sure. We will see. We still have some time left before a break. So let's uh, move into chapter two. <coughs> then we take out here and then we move here. Why is they this? Oh, they came. Do we have any questions so far which have not been asked? This is more or less what you know already. Have you learned anything so far? Trade-off? Arbitrage? Ah, oh, maybe something, okay. Let's hope so. <coughs> Chapter 2 is named The Basics of Supply and Demand. You see, this is slides from 2012, by the way. I haven't uh, done any changes uh, so far. You will see, maybe it's. Okay. This slide is titled The Basics of Supply and Demand, and in green, green here, the supply curve. It says that the supply curve shows the quantity of a good that producers are willing to sell at different prices. So we, we, we think about a curve here. We really don't do, as I said, we perhaps should do, kind of explain this from the bottom. We do that later on. Okay, so we now we kind of assume that there is something called the supply curve, and by definition it is a relation or a function defining the link between quantity and price. Uh, normally we, uh, we use a two-dimensional diagram like this, uh, where we have quantity along the first axis and price along the seven axis second axis. We can, of course, interchange. In some cases we see that, but in most cases this is the normal way of doing it. There's quantity along the first axis and price along the second axis. Of course, this curve could be anything, literally, but there is some, at least at the starting point, you can start thinking a little bit about how this curve should look like. And if you read what it says here, it says that the supply curve labeled S in the figure, so this is the supply curve, the red curve here, shows how the quantity of a good offered for sale changes as the price of the good changes. It says further on, the supply curve is upward sloping, meaning that it moves 
upward and not downward. Okay, so we should talk about upward in the diagram. We think from left to right, upward, downward, also from left to right. This is kind of con a convenient definition. The higher the price, the more firms are able and willing to produce and sell. Does this seem reasonable? Yeah, it does, doesn't it? Sure. At a higher price here, there would be more profit opportunities, more firms would kind of enter and uh, there would be kind of more put into the market. Could we think about the opposite situation? Is that possible? Hard to think. I have not been able to find an example which kind of makes it reasonable to have a downward slope in supply curve. And further is that if production costs fall, if that is the case, of course, firms can produce the same quantity at a lower price or a larger quantity at the same price. That seems reasonable, okay? We can agree on that. In that case, the supply curve shifts, as it says here, to the right from S to S prime. That it kind of goes down here, okay? So for a certain price, in this case, you can, you no, sorry, for a certain quantity, you can get a higher price then. That seems also reasonable, even though we are kind of d dealing into an equilibrium type argument now, and that is kind of the problem with doing this without doing it from the bottom up. So we are kind of making some assumptions here, even though they are kind of nicely hidden here. So, uh, but there, there is some concepts here which, is, which are important that probably will become more important on the next slide. It's a, this is kind of straightforward, more or less talked about this. It slopes upward, a higher price enables current firms to expand production by hiring extra workers and replying extra overtime. This is kind of the, the technical argument. Uh, you can hire more people to capture this higher price. So then you can expand and hence you can produce more, more like a, a logistic type of argument. You can have capacity expansion, there's more money into here, you can build bigger factories which could house all these extra workers, okay? And finally, this is more like a economic arguments. Uh, new firms are attracted. Higher price makes profit opportunities. So implicitly, we are kind of making the greed assumption here. And that is most a lot of problems with this textbook in microeconomics. They tend to kind of not be precise enough about the underlying assumptions. I will try to be that as we move along here by the increased price, typically with higher costs. Okay. What we have said now, in a sense, is that there are two variables which are linked together. Quantity and price for the supplier, okay? In one way or another. But we have argued that it should be pointing in this direction, not in that direction. But is, if we think about the price now as a function of this, this is another way of writing this, isn't it? Or if you, we can use f here, whatever, okay? So, so there is a relation involving a variable q that gives us the price, okay? This is a function, it produces the price for us. We enter the q into this equation, then we get the price. This should kind of indicate that, that there is nothing else that affects these settings. But there is, isn't it? We have already said that, haven't we? It says something here. If production costs fall, firms can produce the same quantity at a lower price or a larger quantity at the same price. The su supply curve then shifts. It moves from there to there. So price cannot be the only variable in the supply curve then. It should, must be more variables. Definitely production costs is one of them. If it's cheaper to hire labor, production cost goes down. If it's cheaper to buy raw material, production costs go down. So there must be more than these singular variables which are natural to put into this relation. As it says here, other factors than price affects the supply curve. In this case, we have listed a few. Wages, of course, if they go up, it becomes more costly to produce. If they go down, it becomes cheaper. If something happens on the financial market side, 
That will also affect it, it? because that affects the economy of the producer. If the interest rate goes up and normally everybody has loans, then of course the cost of capital increases and that has an impact on the cost image of the company. And uh, finally here, raw material costs, if they increase, of course that will also be a normal impact. So you can think of... Uh, <laughs> so in principle, what we're, we're saying here is that this relation is slightly more complex, isn't it? There is Q here, there is wages here, there is uh, financial costs, and there is uh, raw material costs, okay? So it's not as simple as it looked. This is a four variable function, isn't it? It's not easy to draw. It's, it's not... Uh, it's hard enough to draw a two-variable function, isn't it? Then you'd have to do something like this, and it would be some kind of something like this in this space, wouldn't it? So when there is four, we can't even imagine it. Of course, that is the reason why they do this in microeconomics. Okay, we say we look at the most important variable, the relation between price and quantity. Although we know that other things can affect it, we then mimic that by introducing this shift kind of thing. So this shift means that you address these other variables, they have changed, and then you can shift the curve. So instead of struggling with a four-dimensional figure, you can stick to the two-dimensional figure. That's more or less the idea here. Okay? So there's a reason for this. Convenient reason, so to speak. So finally it says here we can think of the supply curve drawn in the last slide as drawn for particular values of the three variables above. A change in one or several of these variables may produce a shift in the supply curve. So in general microeconomic theory, at least at this level, we stick to these two-dimensional curves. Of course, in general courses, you, you, you do this really. Okay, so then you kind of add more variables here, and then you... Yeah, it's a kind of different math that kind of emerges then. Although the principles are the same. In many ways, I think it could be sensible to think about the supply curve more or less as a cost curve for the producers, okay? What changes producers' costs changes the supply curve. Of course, all these three extra elements is related to that. Wages is a direct cost, labor cost, and then there's raw material cost, typically input cost, and then there's this financial cost. These are kind of the three classical elements that kind of affects the cost structure of a firm. If any one or several of these variables change, it changes the cost structure of the firm. Okay. Then we move to demand. Now we are on the other side of the table. These are those who buy the goods. And uh, according to what it says here, that the demand curve shows how much of a good consumers are willing to pay as the price per unit changes. This is kind of a similar type of structure, isn't it? A relation between quantity and price. But as opposed to the supply curve, it seems reasonable to assume that the demand curve is downward sloping. Because you see here that uh, we know that if uh, if we are normal human beings, we would tend to buy more if the price is lower than, that, than if it's high. So if you look at uh, the P1 here, we get the quantity Q1, which are sold in the market. Now if the price increases up to P2, it's not m marked here, then we would get this point, which is lower than Q1. So it would sell less. That seems reasonable. Okay? Could we think about a demand curve going upwards. Is that possible? That means, in a sense, that the more expensive the product is, the more we buy it. Yes, Matt? Like a luxury item? Yeah, like a luxury item, like a Rolex or a Ferrari or a Prada bag or whatever. The, the price could be acting as a signal, okay? Either of real quality or luxury quality. Okay, so there are two types of products in general, okay? Those you, you buy for 
their actual content and quality. But there is another type of products, which we can call signaling products, which you use not for their own quality, but as a product to signal something about yourself. If you buy an expensive suit, then you send a signal. If you buy a Prada bag, you send a signal. You send these signals to people around you. You want to tell them that I am rich. Some silly people like me might then ask the question, why do, don't I just tell them? That's both cheaper and more efficient. So I could go around in this city with a big poster saying I'm rich. We don't see that. Why don't we see that? Maybe you can start doing that. That would have grave impact on these markets. Hmm. Uh, it, it's sad to be kind of... Uh, because if you do that, then you also send a signal, don't you? You send a signal that this person doesn't have the right social antennas. He doesn't or, sh or she doesn't understand the cultural boundaries here. Okay, so, uh, so there is reasons for everything. Has anybody of you ever bought signaling products? Not it's not bad. We do that all the time, don't we? When we buy a football shirt or, or if, if you buy a certain record, it's in many ways it's a signal. Although not as extreme as in this. But if you look at these type of products, then of course you can expect that the price itself, the higher it is, the stronger the signal is. Okay. So even though the production cost of a Rolex watch is just uh, a thousand crowns, you can sell it for fifty or hundred thousand crowns due to the signal related to the brand. Of course, this kind of signal will have to be built up. And in the first part of this uh, uh, product life, you will probably not be able to see this upward sloping uh, uh, demand curve, but it, it's possible. At least it's possible here to, to find such uh, situations. So we are still into this kind of diagram, a relation between quantity and price. The explanation, yeah, the, the, the yes. Okay. Um, I use the supply curve. Uh, the quantity is uh, change is changeable, and uh, the price and as the price goes uh, go, goes up, and the quantity uh, become more. And uh, in this uh, demand curve, uh, the price is changeable. And the I don't think you should think like that. Okay. I think you should think as follows. The price is given, is made by the market. So we, we as agents can kind of not change anything here. It's a, we, we are kind of <laughs> what we are saying is that there is a relation here. Okay, so it's not necessarily up to us to change the price. Because if it's the free market, we can't change the price. We have said that already, haven't we? We can't affect the price. So in, in practice, I think it's, you, you shouldn't think like that. Okay, it's much better to think of it, this is a functional relation. It, it looks like this, and it means, of course, something. It means something about how the relation is. If you move in this direction, if you put less into the market, then the price will go up. If you have the power of changing the price, you can do the other argument, can't you? If we increase the price here, then we can see. So I think instead of thinking about that you can do one thing there and another thing there, that's, that's not fruitful, OK? Let's think as a general equilibrium set. So we are not in the power to change anything here. The suppliers can change the quantity, but uh, uh, they cannot really change the price either. They can decide on how much to produce. The cons consumers can decide on how much to buy. That's reality. The market defines the price here. Uh, yeah. Okay. So the What did you say now? Um, I want to express that as the price changes. As the, the price the changes? Price changes because uh, the market affects the price. And the price changes, then the quantity changes. Yes? Yeah, uh, you can say that, of course. Yeah, yeah. Oh, but I think that the formula is the P, uh, the P. P O Q? Q. Yeah, and this one is the Q and the Q P. Now, in the textbook, they actually. They actually write uh, both curves as the Q on the left-hand side. 
but this doesn't really matter. I would I would not think like this for the moment. Okay, yeah, I think it's it's leading in the wrong direction. Recall that in reality here, the only thing that these agents actually can change is the Q. Okay, that's what they can change. The price is made by the market. Okay, it's only in the mon monopolistic setting that you can change the price. Okay, because then you're alone, then you can actually change the price. Again, you will get some impact on the quantity, but then you can change the price in reality. In a competitive market, you cannot. So I, I think I will stick to that for the moment, okay? It may be confusing if you start thinking like you do now. That's just my simple advice, okay? So let's... Uh, of course, you can do the same here as we did in the supply case. There is not only price which affects consumers' choices, isn't it? There is something else. Quality, for instance, that may affect it. Normally, some would say that prices reflect quality. Maybe it don't. Okay, it could, uh, according to the discussion about the Prada bags, it may not be that like that. But uh, first, a quick run through of the typical arguments for the downward sloping situation. Okay, consumers will normally pay more if the price per unit decreases. All the consumers previously unable to buy are now suddenly able to. Okay, so this price decrease makes the product available for more people. More poor, poor, poor people are able to buy it. And then we di did discuss this one. Okay. Uh, Kelly, do you have something? This was uh, a bad. It was a bad sentence, wasn't it? Consumers will normally pay more if the price per unit decreases. Buy if more. The price decreases. We should buy more. It should be buy more here. Okay. This is a B and B. U, yeah. and not P and A. Sorry, a typo. Okay. Very nice, kid. You are following closely. That's good. Now I think we must take a break. Okay. Sorry about these typos. They, they, they occur from time to time. It should not be paid. It should be buy there.